Uh, we're going to be reading from James chapter 5 again. So if you want to turn in your Bibles to James chapter 5, um, James Bosco asked me what I was going to preach on yesterday, and I said, you, I'm preaching on you. Uh, so we're in James today, and we'll be looking at verses 7 through 11 in what I'm calling, uh, Are We There Yet? Uh, a sermon on patience. Uh, we'll see a lesson from James here. So let's go ahead and read that text, and then we'll, we'll jump into, into it. James 5, beginning in verse 7. Be patient, therefore, brothers, until the coming of the Lord. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, being patient about it, until it receives the early and the late rains. You also be patient. Establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord is at hand. Do not grumble against one another, brothers, so that you may not be judged. Behold, the judge is standing at the door. As an example of suffering and patience, brothers, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. Behold, we consider those blessed who remain steadfast. You have heard of the steadfastness of Job, and you have seen the purpose of the Lord, how the Lord is compassionate and merciful. Let's go to the Lord in prayer as we open His Word. Father, thank You so much for this opportunity to once again preach to your people, to share, to open the word of God and to declare your word to your people. Father, we take this task very seriously knowing that this word that we hold in our hands is your living word. And as we read it, you are speaking to us and it's alive and active and sharper than any two-edged sword piercing to the very core of our beings. I ask you now, Lord, that you would do just that, that you would expose us, for the purpose of encouraging us and lifting us up and transforming us into the beautiful image of Jesus Christ, your Son. So thank you for the word. Be with me as I seek to declare it. Be with all of us as we hear it. And may we leave this place changed, being doers of the word, not hearers only. We ask in the name of Christ. Amen. Are we there yet? That's the common refrain of seven or eight-year-old you, isn't it? Some of you came down from San Antonio this morning, and maybe at one point, one of the children asked, Mom, Dad, are we there yet? You know, I think for me about the annual family summer vacations. It's muggy, it's hot, because inevitably the AC isn't working in that old 2000 Chrysler town and country minivan. The windows are down, pillows are everywhere, potato chips everywhere. Are we there yet? Well, the suffering, oppressed Christians to whom James was writing his letter, they are the kids in the back of the minivan. And James is the father lovingly looking at them in the rearview mirror for the tenth time in as many minutes saying, be patient, we're almost there, but not yet. But for these Christians, and we talked a little bit about this in the first hour, it wasn't as simple as a muggy minivan with no AC and cramped leg space. They were enduring serious oppression and persecution. So James says in verse 7, therefore, they were the diaspora, these people. And if we look in Acts chapter 8, we see why they were scattered. It was because their faith in Christ demanded that they be excluded from their former way of life. Many of them, the Jewish people who were rejected by their countrymen, their parents, their families, their religion for following Christ. And as I mentioned in the first hour, the the entire book opens with James immediately addressing these suffering Christians. And if you look in the verses just before verse 7, we see that that it was many of, of these Christians who were being wickedly oppressed by the wealthy, who were actually condemning them and taking advantage of them. You look there in in James chapter 5, 
he, he begins in verse 1, Come now, you, you rich, weep and howl for the miseries that are coming upon you because the rich were abusing the poor. Any of those poor were the Christians James was writing to. And so they were suffering. And James tells them in that context, because of your suffering, therefore, I've got something to tell you. And I know that many of us can relate to this. Certainly, individually, we can relate to this, can't we? The trials and tribulations that life throws at us. But, but also, to a degree, corporately, as a church body, we can relate to this. How much longer, Lord, until you give us clarity and direction? And how much longer until you establish us? Lord, how much longer do we have to take of, of this circumstance or, or this difficult trial? Are we there yet, Lord? And oftentimes, isn't it, the response from the front seat, be patient. Be patient. James in these verses, gives us a valuable lesson on patience in the Christian life. It's a lesson that every single one of us needs to learn, both individually, and it's a lesson that we need to learn as a church, corporately. Perhaps it's a lesson we don't like. I don't know about you, but sometimes when I am most impatient, the last thing I want to hear is, be patient. The traffic's annoying, you're going to be late to the appointment. Oh, don't worry about it. Be patient. I am being patient. It's the last thing you want to hear when you're, when you're at the height of frustration, isn't it? Somebody coming along. Patience now. But we need this lesson. We need this lesson. And so James gives us five lessons on patience in this text. And, and if you're taking notes, they will be these. Patience is necessary. We'll see that in verse 7. Secondly, patience is temporary. We'll see that in verse 8. Third, patience is belief. We'll see that in verse 9. And in verse 10, patience is proven in suffering. And finally, verse 11, patience is rewarded. Five lessons. If you missed all of those, we'll go through them and, and they'll be clear. Let's start out with lesson number one. Patience is necessary. Look at verse 7 again. Be patient, therefore, brothers, until the coming of the Lord. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, being patient about it until it receives the early and the late rains. Patient is necessary. Yes, it's necessary because it's a command. Anything God commands us is necessary. We obey. But it's, it's, he gives us reason for why it's necessary, and it's it's namely this, our final destination has not yet arrived. As a Christian, we are awaiting the eternal kingdom with our Lord. And He's not returned yet, so we're not there yet. So if little eight-year-old you was excited on your summer vacation because you were going to Disneyland and you couldn't wait to get there, how much more excited should we as Christians be for our final home, our final destination? Listen to these words. You, I'm sure, know them well because they give us great comfort. But in Revelation chapter 21, we're told that when, when Christ returns, listen to the paradise that is ushered in when Jesus Christ returns. John says, I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. And the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from heaven, out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people. And God himself will be with them as their God. And he will wipe away every tear from their eyes. And death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain any more. For the former things have passed away. What a glorious hope, Christian. 
Isn't that what you're longing for? The moment of Christ's triumphal return when everything that is evil will no longer exist. When everything that causes pain will be vanished. Even the tears coming down your cheeks. There will be no more sin. Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians 5 that that we're burdened in this this present circumstance. We have these fleshly impulses and and the flesh hanging on and and it it leads us and tempts us. and, And how often do you find yourself believing those deceptions? But when Christ returns, no more sin. In that day, it will be completely gone. No injustice, no sorrow, no more fighting for your affections, no temptation. Truly, like the psalmist said in Psalm 16, at thy right hand is bliss forevermore. Christ returning. And so we need patience, Christian, because our final destination, well, it's not here yet. Christ hasn't come yet. And so we need to wait for that day. Patience is necessary. But James, as he so often does, as uh, as an excellent teacher, he draws something further out, and he does so with an illustration. He gives us the illustration of the farmer. Look there in the second part of verse 7. I'm going to turn back to James. Chapter 5, verse 7. See the farmer... And how he waits for the precious fruit of the earth, being patient about it until it receives the early and the late rains. Uh, A little something about farming for you ranch hands. I'll teach you a few things. Just kidding. Uh, I just found out what a steer is yesterday. We won't go into the details. But he gives us the illustration of a farmer. And he says, look at the farmer, Christian. Now, something about farming. Uh, Rain is necessary in farming. It's necessary at the beginning when you plant the seeds, and it's necessary at the end. It's a holistic process. Without the early rain, in the early part of the the season, the seeds won't germinate, and they won't produce sprouts and grow. But that's not all. The late rains that come in March and April grow the harvest to full maturity, ready to be harvested. Ask a farmer, There's no shortcuts, right? You've got to wait. And you need all of the components, the early rain to germinate, but the late rain to mature. Every farmer knows that. And different seasons affect different crops. It may rain more than usual or drought. It might be colder or hotter. Uh, A cold is when you shiver. It's a thing you don't understand here in Laredo, but in other parts of the world, uh, it gets cold and people have jackets and the such. But the farmers at times need different climates. But but for the farmer, the end goal is always the same, isn't it? To produce a crop, to have a fully mature vegetable. But something is happening when the seeds go into the ground. They, They go into the ground inedible and almost invisible. You throw them on the ground and can hardly see them. But six months later, they come out as fruit or vegetable. What happened in that process? There was recently a Huffington Post article entitled, The Farming Life, A Lesson in Patience. Listen to a section of the article. These are farmers recounting this lesson in patience. They say, the garden has taught us life lessons far beyond how to build a raised bed and make goat manure tea. We've relearned how to wait. It can seem like an eternity planting or between planting the first seed and the moment the first seedling pushes up from the earth. It's even longer before that seedling grows into a plant and we harvest the first tomato. After waiting patiently for all those weeks and months, no tomato has ever tasted better. Absence has really made the heart and the taste buds grow fonder. So maybe the garden is a remedy for the ale's of modern society. When you always have immediate access to everything you could ever want, you don't truly appreciate anything. 
If you haven't worked for something or aren't paying its true cost, then you lose all perspective of what to value. We might just relearn that change doesn't happen overnight. Well, if that's true for the farmer, so it's true for your soul, Christian. As God uses rain to grow and produce fruit from the seed, He is using the rains of trial and suffering to produce in you the mature fruit of love and joy and kindness and gentleness. But it takes time. There's no shortcuts in the Christian life. Time, isn't it, often the most difficult part of any trial. When I was a soccer player, at the end of practice, they would have us do certain strength exercises, and one I always remember is, is uh, planks for your abs, and you're having to hold your plank for a minute or two minutes. And I remember telling myself, I can do anything for 60 seconds. We can endure pain that's short and sharp. But what happens when that pain endures for hours and for days, years, decades? A lifetime. Time is often the greatest difficulty of a trial. How often do we hear the psalmist, How long, O Lord? Will you cast me off forever? Where are you, Lord? Time. You know, we've got an interesting relationship with time, don't we, as people? We want it to speed up when we're excited, slow down when we're enjoying one another, pass quickly when we're in pain. Time. But wait patiently, James tells us, because it is time itself that God is using to produce something in you. The time is necessary. And therefore, patience is necessary. The second lesson he shows us is that patience is temporary. Are we there yet? Not yet. Be patient. But then these beautiful words for eight-year-old Jeremy, we don't have long to go. Oh, I love that. Because there was a ray of hope After 15 times of be patient, now dad was saying, but not long to go. And look at verse 8. You also be patient. Establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord is at hand. He's coming soon. Now, maybe you're thinking, well, this was 2,000 years ago, and he's still not here. Well, Peter would tell us in 2 Peter 3 that for the Lord a day is like a thousand years and a thousand years as for a day. And people will mock and say, sure, God's coming back soon, but where is he? But we know he's coming like a thief in the night at any moment. And we do not have long to wait. And you say, what do you mean we don't have long to wait? It's been 72 years I've waited and been in this trial. It's been 10 years of the the prime years of my youth. What do you mean, not long? And my friend, this is where we need a shift in perspective. 80, 90, 120 years is nothing in comparison to eternity that will be spent in glory. And so when you look at the span of your eternal soul existence, This life, no matter how long, is a short period. There's not long to go. And so James tells us that patience is necessary and patience is temporary. You will not always need to be patient. There's a third lesson that that comes up in in James, or in chapter 5, verse 9. Patience is belief. Look at verse 9. Do not grumble against one another, brothers, so that you may not be judged. Behold, the judge is standing at the door. 
Now, in studying this text, you could say this seems a bit out of place. All of a sudden, he's talking about patience, and now he's talking about judgment and grumbling. Why are we talking about judgment and grumbling? But let's be honest for a minute. As you're sitting in the back seat of the boiling minivan, you begin to bicker, don't you? You begin to pick at one another. Get your feet off of my shoulder. You remember those days, Joy and Josh? They were tough days. I was there with you guys. The long trips to Denton. You start to bicker, and you're impatient. And you're thinking, I just want to be with anyone else in this universe except for the person sitting next to me. Well, James knows that. He knows that the, the soul gets irritable. And we start to tell ourselves, there's not much more I can take. And so I have every right to snap at you like that. Because look at my circumstances. And so he warns against it. So let me ask you, grumbling. In the Bible, where does your mind go when I say grumbling? Perhaps it goes to, I didn't hear whoever said whatever, but perhaps it goes to Israel in the wilderness. We can turn back there for a moment. I want to give us a jet tour kind of through the circumstances of Israel in the Exodus. Israel at this um, juncture in their history was enslaved to Pharaoh and the Egyptians. And you remember in the early part of Israel's history, and they receive a promise in Exodus chapter 3 and verse 8 that God says to Moses, I have come down to deliver Israel out of the hands of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of the land to a good and broad land, a land flowing with milk and honey to the place of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites. God promised to Israel a people who were literally enslaved to a nation. Being, being servants, being whipped and beaten, manual labor, treated as slaves were treated. And God comes to his people and says, I will deliver you, and I've got a wonderful plan for you. In fact, I will take you to a land that you cannot even imagine. A land overabundant with milk and honey. We read in chapter 4 and verse 31 that the people believed God. He has a good purpose for us. He has a wonderful plan for us. He's taking us somewhere. He's doing something. We believe Him. But notice what happened to their belief. Exodus chapter 5, Pharaoh refuses to let the people go. And we read, In verse 20, that the people met Moses and Aaron who were waiting for them as they came out from Pharaoh and they said to them, the Lord look on you and judge you because you have made a stink in the sight of Pharaoh and his servants and have put a sword in their hand to kill us. The first sign of resistance and the people start to grumble. Though a chapter earlier, they believed God would deliver them. And then we know well the Red Sea. They leave Egypt and they're confronted by this mountains on both sides and a sea and Pharaoh's army. And what do they do? They begin to complain. But then God miraculously delivers them and they get to the other side. Wouldn't that be enough? Wouldn't they finally believe God? But then they get thirsty and they complain to Moses. Why have you taken us out? Just so we could die of thirst? And Moses, in in chapter 15 and throughout, you can hear Moses recounting the promises of God, saying to, to the people, believe me, God's taking us out, and that's where he's taking us. Believe the word of God. And yet over and over, they begin complaining when they get hungry. Why have you taken us out? We had food in Egypt. And what we learn here are lessons about grumbling. Three lessons in particular. The first, we learn from Exodus 16 that grumbling has an object, and the object of grumbling is God himself. You think that your grumbling is against circumstances or people. What we discover in Exodus 16 is actually that when you grumble, you are grumbling against God. 
Moses tells the people, God has heard your grumbling against the Lord. They weren't grumbling at Moses. They were grumbling at God. So grumbling's object is God, and grumbling's effect is hatred. In Exodus 17, 4, Moses cried to the people, or sorry, cried to the Lord, what shall I do with this people? They are almost ready to stone me. So angry and so discontent and bitter were the people in their grumbling that they wanted to kill Moses, their leader. Grumbling's effect is hatred. Now, turn to Hebrews chapter 3, or you can just listen, but in the New Testament, we're given a third insight into the nature of grumbling, and specifically what was happening with the people of Israel. In verse 16, we read this, for who are those who heard and yet rebelled? Was it not all those who left Egypt led by Moses? And with whom was he provoked, God, for 40 years? Was it not with those who sinned, whose bodies fell in the wilderness? And to whom did God swear that they would not enter his rest, but to those who were disobedient? So we see they were unable to enter because of unbelief. The people were grumbling because they refused to believe the promises of God. They refused to believe that God was good, and they refused to believe that God was able to fulfill what he had said. Now, this comes back to you and me. Chapter tw- or Verse 12 of Hebrews 3 says this, take care, brothers. Now he's speaking to us, lest there be in any of you an evil, unbelieving heart leading you to fall away from the living God. What does this have to do with patience? Well, we look back at the people of Israel and we can see it, can't we? God had a reason for why they were enslaved in Egypt. God had a reason for why Pharaoh refused. God had a reason that they didn't have water and they didn't have food. He wanted to demonstrate his power and his justice. Why did he have them with no water? To show them that from the rock, Water would be supplied miraculously. And that rock, Paul tells us, is Christ. That from Christ we are supplied every spiritual thirst of our soul. God was doing something in their suffering. And yet the people refused to believe it. Isn't the exodus of Israel One of, if not the preeminent gospel illustration of the entire Old Testament. But they weren't patient. And they grumbled. And the essence of their grumbling was unbelief. And so they were judged. So go back to James 5, 9. Don't grumble against one another, brothers, so that you may not be judged. Behold, the judge is standing at the door Impatience, in other words, equals unbelief. Unbelief. Whereas patience equals belief. To put it simply in a sentence, I would say this. When you believe God, life becomes a matter of trust and patience. When you believe God, life becomes a matter of trusting and waiting. Simplify. Patience equals belief. That's our third lesson. But then he goes on to give us a fourth in verse 10. And it's this, that patience is proven in suffering. Look at verse 10 of James chapter 5. As an example of suffering and patience, brothers, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. So these Christians to whom James is writing are suffering, and James is urging them on. And so as an encouragement, he brings forward a helpful example. He brings forward the prophets. Now, the prophets of old had much to endure. They were often maligned and brutally treated, many of them killed. 
because they spoke the word of God, which was not always an encouraging word. Oftentimes, it was a word of judgment. And the prophets didn't even have what you and I and the church James was writing to had. They didn't even have the full revelation of the person of Christ. We have so much more. We understand so much more than what they understood. And the prophets were hated by the people. That's why Jesus says, as he's weeping over Jerusalem, Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it. So the prophets were mistreated. And yet, even with lesser revelation than what we have, they maintained their belief in God. They didn't waver. They didn't buckle under the pressure. Why not? Because they knew there was a reward. Hebrews 11 tells us that they had faith in what God promised. They believed God. And so their belief was proven in their patience amidst much suffering even when it costs them their life. Patience is proven in suffering. And much like the prophets who believe there to be a reward, you and I will be patient if there's a reward at the end of it, won't we? Mothers, with your children, you'll be patient for nine months and hours of excruciating pain and delivery because of the reward. There's a child being born. There's many circumstances. We know I'll I'll endure the chemotherapy and the pain it will do me because there's a reward. It means 20 more years of life with my loved ones. I can endure the pain because of what's on the other side. And that's the next lesson and the final lesson. It's patience is rewarded. Look there in verse 11. Behold, we consider those blessed who have remained steadfast. You've heard of the steadfastness of Job, and you've seen the purpose of the Lord, how the Lord is compassionate and merciful. There is a blessing for those who endure. And in order to show that blessing, James uses the example of Job as a model of patience. Now, Was Job a model of patience? At the start of the book, he was. (laughs) He began patient. The Lord gives and the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. But if you actually read through the book of Job, you discover that as his circumstances change, so does his disposition. There are impassioned outbursts, one man writes, against the shallow platitudes of his so-called comforters or his distressed protests to God himself. Job is not a model of stoic patience. Oh God, whatever you ordain, take my life, take my children, whatever you ordain. Read Job. There are times when he has outbursts against God himself. He's he's done with his friends who are offering him little Christian cliches. Job is hardly a model of patience. The real virtue of Job is honesty. Job 3.3, let the day on which I perish, let the day perish on which I was born. Job 3.11, why did I not die at birth? coming out of the womb and expiring. Job showed himself to be be very much like you and me, with his frustrations and his human feelings and emotion. But the important thing to note about Job is that his basic, foundational, underlying faith in God never wavered. He never succumbed to his wife's suggestion, curse God and die. He endured incredible suffering, insensitivity, misunderstanding, and yet through it all, and yes, through much emotion and angst, 
and ter- times of turmoil and arguing with God Himself, Job continued to trust God through it all. He never abandoned his God. And this should be a comfort to you. There's no stoic in Job. He's human, and so are you. And for you to cry, and for you to be confused, and at times angry, and to bring arguments to the Lord, and to say, God, what are you doing with my life? And why have you chosen me to walk through this? You have men like Job who walked through the same thing and felt the same way. And yet, his faith in who God is never wavered. He never took his wife's suggestion to curse God and die. And that endurance is rewarded because God has a purpose. Now look again at verse 11. You've heard that that through it all, Job was steadfast, and you've seen the purpose of the Lord. So Christian, take comfort in your suffering that none of it is meaningless. None of the hours are wasted. Those ten years of the prime of your youth that you thought would be spent making a family, and yet you're still single, not a single one of those moments and hard, difficult nights has been wasted. In the five decades that you've dealt with that chronic pain. Or the turmoil at home. Not a moment has been wasted. It's not meaningless. Because God has a purpose. Just like the father driving his children to Disneyland. Where they'll be amazed and awed and overjoyed. Because they don't even know what to do with a life-size Mickey. God has a purpose in your suffering. You might not see it. You're in the backseat of the minivan. All you can see and smell are your brother's feet. You don't see it, but it doesn't mean it doesn't exist. Years ago, I heard a helpful illustration about exactly this. Imagine if you were camping in the state of Michigan, at one of the Great Lakes, and in your tent there we had set up, I asked you, hey, go into the tent and tell me if there are any uh, uh, golden retrievers in the tent, any of those beautiful big dogs. And you go in the tent, you look in, and there's no no dogs in the tent. So you come out and say, Jeremy, uh, I don't see any dogs in the tent. And then I say, okay, great, now go in the tent and tell me, are there any noceums in the tent? Now, noceums are... Uh, little creatures known to Michigan. They're tiny bugs that are invisible to the human eye. You can't see them, but under a microscope. And so you go into the tent, you look in and you say, nope, Jeremy, there are no no noceums. I say, well, there could be thousands of noceums in the tent. Just because you don't see them doesn't mean they're not there. So it is with the purposes of God. God could have a thousand reasons for why he has you enduring the fires you're enduring. And just because you can't see them from your little vantage point at this moment in time doesn't mean they're not there. In fact, they are there because he tells you it's not meaningless. Look at Job. He had a purpose in doing everything he did to Job. Job wasn't in heaven to see the conversation between God and Satan. We see it, but Job didn't. Job didn't know why God took his children and his health and his wealth. We know it because we read the end of the story. But Job didn't. And maybe in your suffering, you don't see it either. But what can you say? Can you say like Job in Job 13, 15, though he slay me, I will hope in him. Yet, I will argue my ways to his face. Job argued. He wasn't a stoic. 
He's human, like you and me, and yet his rock-solid, confident trust in God never wavered because God had a purpose. Which is why John Calvin said that afflictions ought to be ever estimated by their end. And we haven't seen the end of the story in your afflictions and mine, but there's a purpose. And so we are to be patient. But then James tells us something shocking, really. Look at verse 11. You've seen the purpose of God. How the Lord is compassionate and merciful. Now, I don't know about you, but that's not what I get when I read the book of Job. Compassion and mercy. You do realize that God took all of Job's children, his reputation, his money, everything he had on earth. He brought him to the precipice of destruction. And we are supposed to read that and say, compassion and mercy. But God was compassionate. Job, languishing in the loss of his children, struggled to see it. But the compassion of God was there because in taking his ten children, God gave Job ten more. And you say, but he lost ten. How does ten more make up for the lost ten? No, my friend, I would argue that Job gained twenty children. For in the resurrection, at the final destination where we are all headed, Job's children would be restored to him. God tells him, all I've taken from you, I will restore. The, 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 the persecution or, the, or the, uh, the taking away of Job's possessions and his wealth and his reputation restored on earth. And yet there was more to be restored in heaven. To have 20 children with him in glory. Job's fortunes restored. That is the compassion of God. And the mercy of God, instead of giving Job what he deserved, God gave everything he didn't deserve. You and I do realize that everything this side of hell is in the category of mercy, don't we? What an astonishing vantage point to read the story of Job and to walk away saying, my, what a compassionate and merciful God. That's an astonishing vantage point, but it's not a natural one. We need the wisdom that comes from above to look at life this way. I want to close with with an illustration. It wasn't long ago that a friend of mine, his son suddenly passed away. The morning it happened, I spoke with a brother at church who, who told me that in the past week, two couples at the church got pregnant, announced pregnancy. One couple had a miscarriage. One person got saved, and one church staff member's wife abandoned the faith and left him. And a pastor in Arizona at a church where a lot of men from Grace Church serve, accidentally ran over his five-year-old son and killed him. As we were reflecting on the reality of life in a fallen world, there's joy, a wedding yesterday, and there's pain, Luis's uncle passing away two days prior. It's life in a broken world. And as I reflected with my friend over these events, um, I looked up the, 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 the article of, of the man who had run over his son. And what I found was a letter that he sent to his church. And I want to read that letter to you. He said, Dear family, friends, and many we have never even met, We want to express our thanks to all of you for the overwhelming love and care we have experienced these last few days. Thank you for praying. 
Thank you for encouraging us with scripture. Thank you for your practical provisions. Thank you for mourning with us so well. And we especially thank God who is our rock and ultimate comfort. He has used all of you as a means of grace to us in our sorrow. For those of you who don't know, on Monday, our benevolent Lord saw fit to take our precious youngest child, who is five years old, Caleb, from this world. Our family was vacationing up at our family ranch, as we often do. The Lord's kindness to us was so abundant as we had a wonderful week together as a family. Caleb got to hunt with Asher, Elijah, and me. Caleb got to ride the quad by himself for the first time. He did amazing, and he loved it so much. Caleb was the first out of the house to congratulate Asher on the deer, and the whole family enjoyed processing the deer together. He played foosball games with everyone in the family. He enjoyed hunting for lizards, spiders, and moths with Kyla. Julie and Caleb got many sweet snuggle times together. There were many hugs, kisses, and I love yous this week. There were too many joys to mention them all, and we continue to treasure each one with thankful hearts. But in the afternoon, as we were preparing to come home from our family vacation, we were loading up my truck. The kids were all helping. As usual, Caleb was jumping in to help as well. He was such a sweet servant. I was going to move my truck closer to the home to continue loading up, While I had thought the kids dispersed behind me for another activity, our precious Caleb had actually moved in front of me. As I pulled the truck forward, I inadvertently ran over Caleb. The best we can tell, he had possibly dropped something in front of the truck and was attempting to get it. Realizing what might have happened, I quickly jumped from my truck and sought to care for him. It is clear now that Caleb passed very quickly. We thank God for that grace. However, I, with Julie's help, performed CPR until medical professionals arrived. As they took over, every attempt to revive Caleb was made with no success. We are grateful that the Lord protected Julie and the other children from having to see the tragic accident take place. That was a mercy from from the Lord. My cry while performing CPR is our cry today. We know God is good. We dare not ask God to bend his will to ours, but rather ask that he bend our will to his, even if that means being broken and crushed. For the tender, mending care of our loving shepherd is precious to us. We will not reject the anguish, for in the depths of our anguish are the mountains of his comfort. And we do not fight against our sorrow, For the intensity of each sorrow is a testimony of how precious our Caleb was to us and how intense our love was for him. Both of these are graces from God to us. We thank God for the undeserved blessing it was to be with Caleb for five years, nine months, and twenty days. Each moment with him as an indescribable gift. He brought such joy to our lives and sweet energy to our home. We don't need answers to why beyond what our sovereign God has given to us in his word. For in his word is every answer we need. And his word is more precious to us than all the riches of the world. Even more than the riches of parenthood. What else would we need? And where else would we go than into the loving arms of our Savior? Our great God has provided for our biggest need in the forgiveness of our sins through the death of his own son. With that precious truth in mind, we dare not question his love. How could we? Rather, we cling to him. You all have been a means of God's loving care for us. And for that, we thank you and worship him. We know God is sovereign And there is no better place for us than where he has us today. We trust. We yield. We mourn. We bless his name. And though our tears fall almost constantly, we fall on our faces in worship. Blessed is the name of our Lord. My friends, the suffering is coming. Do you know Jesus? Will you be able to respond like this? 
in your own strength, it's utterly impossible. For the unbeliever, there's, there's no reason for patience. Because there's no destination to look forward to. Only a destination of death to be feared. But for the Christian, for the one who has placed their hope in Christ, repenting of their sins and placing their faith in the person of Christ, for the Christian at the end of this hot, muggy, cramped car ride is the eight-year-old's paradise of Disneyland. At the end of the road for the Christian is glory. And so, as Paul says in Romans 8, I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. For in this hope we were saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope. For what Who hopes for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. Are we there yet? Christian, be patient. It won't be long. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word, your life-giving word, your hope-supplying word. Give us eyes to see, ears to hear, and may every person in this room find the hope of Christ that allows them to walk through every circumstance of life, trusting and waiting, for their hope is in you. It's in the name of Christ I pray. Amen.